whole story through one man and one woman. Way back in the 1960s, a, a, a drug addict called Sonny Argonzoni was running the streets when another man found him. You may recognize the name of this man. The other man's name was Nicky Cruz, the great, well-known, worldwide evangelist who was saved by the ministry of David Wilkinson, who was obviously right there the founder of Teen Charge. And it was through the ministry of Teen Charge that our founder, Pastor Sonny, found God and got clean and got saved and all that. Then he left Teen Charge, left the program, and then the Lord placed upon his heart to start a ministry. In the beginning it was called Victory Temple, but over the years it changed to Victory Outreach. And as I was watching yesterday, I was just reminded through Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie sitting there in this park, beaming all over the world through YouTube, to Scotland, to Africa. We're in South Africa. You know, we've got like nine churches in South Africa now. You know, we're all over. You know, our original pastors were just this week, they were just in Sweden connecting with people. Not saying we want to plant a church there, but how many know you never know God's opening a door? But we're all over the world, and I'm always just in awe that it was just the faithful obedience of just one man and one woman to the call of God that just says, you know what, God, if you can use me, use me. I may not have much, right? I don't own much, right? Fell out of school, right? Never left school with no, you know, no grades, no nothing, you know? When, when somebody talked talk to me about higher school, I thought they were talking about being stoned at school. <laughs> but way back in the 60s, a young man called Sonny Argonzoni got, got a hold of God. And God got a hold of him. And all these years later, we are here in Glasgow, sitting in this sanctuary because of the obedience of one man and one woman. Continues to blow me away. Continues to blow me away, away what God can do. And um, as I was just watching yesterday, I saw all the people, I saw all the things, and I'm thinking about all the recovery homes that they have. And with the churches and recovery homes and training centers all over the world, we have close to 600 centers all over the world because of one man and one woman's obedience to the call of God upon their life. And, and I just, I, I, I was watching that yesterday thinking, God, I know you've got a plan for Glasgow. I know you've got a plan for Scotland. And God, I know sometimes in the natural, things don't look like it's ever going to happen. Things don't look like this and things don't look like that. Have you ever felt like that? God, I know there's something there, but I can't just quite see it. I can't see how it's going to happen, but I feel it in my bones. Like, like Jeremiah said, there's something shot in my bones, God. I know you've got something for me, God, but I can't quite see it. But yesterday I was reminded through watching Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie that anything is possible. Anything is possible. Today's message, I'm going to title today's message, um, The Hub. The Hub. This is what I believe our church is called to be. I believe we're called to be a hub. What does hub stand for? Well, I'm sure you can tell me, you can see it behind me on the screen. A hospital, a university, and a base. A hospital, a university, and a base. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you today that you're with us. And Lord, today we thank you, Lord, that the doors of the church, from the beginning of time, the doors of the church have always been open. The Lord, even when persecution hits the church, the doors of the church and the arms of God and the gates of heaven are never closed. And we thank you today, Lord, that we sit here today as recipients of grace, as the Lord calling hallelujah. Recipients of mercy. We thank you today, Lord, that we have been saved and transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, today I ask you by the Holy Spirit that you would speak to us, minister to us, Lord. Lord, that we would not leave this sanctuary the same. Do something in us that would change everything around us for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of this message is The Hub, the Hospital, the University, and the Base. When I first came into church over, over 20 years ago, I remember somebody telling me, I said, oh, I don't fit here. And somebody told me, he said, no, you don't understand. The church is a hospital. The church is a place where broken people come. The church is a place where those who are needing healing, needing hope, needing restoration, needing guidance, that the church was a hospital. 
I was being told that the church was a place for the sick and for those who needed healing in their lives. And I believe this concept was adapted from Jesus' words recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, 31 and 32. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And I've come to call out not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners and need to repent. You see, in this text, Jesus was responding to questions of his affiliation with sinners. The Pharisees and the religious people were questioning why Jesus continually hung around with those that could give him nothing in return. Jesus was continually having dinner, walking with, spending time with, having fellowship with, breaking bread with those who could offer him nothing back in return. And Jesus responded to the Pharisees by telling them that he came to save sinners and to lead them to repentance. You see, but I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that he came. I'm grateful that he came into my life over 20 years ago and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit led me to a place of repentance. What does repentance mean? Repentance means not just sorry for what we did, but recognizing that our sin, that our mistakes, that our lifestyles were grieving the heart of God. And that I was God's child, I was God's creation, and I wouldn't want to grieve the heart of God by living this same way now that it's been explained and now that it's been exposed to me. And when I started to see that my life was, was, was in the sight of God was, you know, repulsive in a sense it led me to a place of repentance and repentance isn't just saying sorry repentance is a place of a 180 basically walking this way I'm, I'm, the, the, I, I see God and my eyes are open my sin is exposed my guilt, my shame, all this is exposed before this holy and pure God and I make a decision in my heart that because God has saved me because he's ransomed me because I'm bought by the blood because he paid a price for my life, because he died upon the cross of Calvary for my life, and that I was a child of God, chosen and redeemed and, and birthed into the kingdom of God, that God had a plan for me from the beginning of time, that I decided that I no longer wanted to walk the way that I was walking, that I'd done a 180 in this direction and started walking in the other way. But it wasn't just walking in the other way, it was also my mind also desired to think like how God's mind thought. That God, my mind is ugly. My thoughts are horrible sometimes. God, the, 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 the things that come in, the, the imaginations, the dreams that I have, God, I don't desire them any longer. I repent from all that thinking. I repent from these ways. And Lord, I'm going to follow your instructions. And my mind is going to be focused on Jesus. That's repentance. And I think somewhere along the line within church, somewhere along the line, we've I think sometimes we've we we we've we've created, you know, I'm, I'm talking in the general church that, that we've created gatherings. We've created gatherings of people who know how to clap and know how to dance and know how to sing, but but haven't repented of the sin, and so they're stuck and they're bound, and all they ever do is go around in circles. Because repentance of our sin leads us to a place of brokenness and holiness and righteousness yeah. where we stand before a holy God. And I don't know about you, but listen, every time I think about forgiveness and repentance, it's like, it's like coming in the shower. Mm. Oh, I'm free, I'm clean. Yeah. Woo! Uh, clean by the blood of Jesus, free. Mm. And I don't know about you, but when you realize how clean you get from your salvation at that moment of salvation when you recognize that you've been justified by the blood of Jesus, which makes, which basically says that you feel just as if I had never sinned. Mm -hmm. And you feel free. Can you remember that day you felt free? Remember that day you, you felt that encounter with God? You felt that bubble up inside you? Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus loves me. I'm saved. I'm no longer bound by these things anymore. Yeah. Do you remember those days? You felt this freshness. You felt this cleanness. You felt forgiven. You felt redeemed. You felt loved again. You felt absolutely like you were who you were supposed to be. Yeah. And when you walk like that, you talk like that, you live like that, and you constantly live in a lifestyle of repentance, I mean, we won't want to do the same things anymore. 
We don't want to sin like we used to. We don't want to argue like we used to. We don't want to think like we used to. When anything comes into our life at any stage, a sin and an ugly thought or a, a, an anger or something, we say, hey, Lord, I, I pull this down, Lord, and forgive me of this thinking. Forgive me of these ways, Lord. I'm yours. Jesus compared sin to sickness. And he deemed himself the master physician. And I believe the church should be a hospital where Jesus is the master physician. See, I believe that as born again believers filled with the Spirit of God, that the first place we should come to when anything is wrong in our life is the place of prayer. It's the place of the feet of Jesus. And I'm not saying, trust me, I'm not saying never visit a doctor. I'm not saying all of that. I'm all for all that stuff. I believe God has given people wisdom and skills and talents to work alongside and under God, whether they know it or not. But as believers... When there's something sick in our life or something dark in our life or something that's not quite right in our life, the first place we go isn't Facebook. <laughs> Poster stuff. The first place we go isn't Instagram. The first place we go isn't to, you know, the wee place in the corner, the gossip house over there. The first place we go to when something's wrong in our life is we come to the master position. Yes. We come to the one who is able not just to heal the flesh, but most importantly, who is able to heal the soul. And here leads me to another thing. The Bible says that we're tripartite, that we're made up of three parts. One of the last parts, and one of the most untouched parts, if I'm honest with you, is the place of our soul. You see, when you get born again, your spirit gets regenerated. Your spirit gets born again. Hallelujah! I'm born again. I need an old school bed across the here. <laughs> our spirit is born again. Right? Our spirit is born again. We are, our spirit, spiritually, we're back connected with God through regeneration, through the cross of Calvary. Our flesh, which is made up of our body, right? Our body is the flesh. Because of your inside is made whole and starting to walk right and live right, you're automatically, your outside, your flesh, begins to start taking on the form of health. Oh, you're looking well. Praise the Lord. Why oh, you don't look like you used to? Praise the Lord. Born again. Jesus in the inside, working on the outside. Mm. Oh, what a change in my life. That's another song. <laughs> but the soul, the soul is a place that gets untouched because nobody really wants to go there. Mm. But if I'm honest with you, but when you come into a hospital and you come and see the doctor and he says, what's wrong with you? It's going to tell a joke there. Yeah. Oh, man. Doctor, doctor, if you want a pair of, pair of curtains, <laughs> you pull yourself together. <laughs> but when we come to the doctor if we really want healed, then if you've got a broken ankle, you don't run in the doctor and say, what's wrong with you? Go, I've stubbed my, I've stubbed my finger. See, somebody once came up with this coined, this, coined this saying that says, what you never reveal can never be healed. If you don't reveal it, it can never be healed. Because it has to be exposed, it has to be brought into the kingdom of light. It has to be brought before the one who has the authority and the power to heal. And it's one of the biggest kind of taboos within the church today. We have lots of people jumping up and doing, we have lots of people spinning, we have lots of people doing all these things, but the soul is a mess. What does the soul comprise of? Our memories, our thoughts, our pain, our shame, our guilt. In fact, your soul is a place that continues to play old beat max videos. <laughs> memories of the past, old VHS, the old things you've done, the old places you went, the old things that happened from the area of your soul. It's a place that we, it's a place that generates these types of things. It's kind of like the engine of that. So one of the places that we are being honest with you is that we need to bring our soul to the Lord. If we really want to be fruitful, we really want to be healthy, we really want to be in this till the hubcaps fall off, we want to be in this for longevity, then we really have to bring our soul to the Lord and say, Lord, I open up my heart to you. 
Lord, I've received your Lord and Savior. And, and Lord, because I want to be everything you've called me to be, Lord, I'm opening up my entire being to you. Lord, take all of I have. So when we come in, we need to be honest with our condition before the Lord. Because if we're never honest with our condition, we can never truly find healing for the condition. You know, sometimes when you speak to people and say, how long has you been in that condition? Oh, not long. A couple of weeks. But in reality, it's a couple of years. It's deeper than we let on. It's darker than we let on. It's sunken further than we let on. We've got to be honest with Jesus. I, I, listen, I'm here for prayer. Zoe and I, we're here for prayer. Nancy, Pastor, team, we're here for prayer. We're here to lay hands. We're here to help. We're here to counsel. We're here to, we're here to do all these different things. We can't heal the soul. Only the maker. Only the divine maker can heal the soul. We can encourage you. We can help. But we can, you know, help work some stuff out, answer some questions, or plant some seeds of questions to figure out the answer. But we can't heal the soul. Only through prayer and revelation and love of Jesus Christ, exposing our life to him, coming in and saying, Lord, I'm tired of walking around these same circles. I'm tired, Lord, of every time I get myself six months, every time I get myself eight months, every time I get myself a year, every time Lord, I get so far, every time I get a job, every time I get a relationship, every time something happens, I get so far. And then something happens. And I just believe and prophesy and pray over you guys that we would allow the Lord into the deepest, darkest areas of our lives because guess what? He's the only one that can help us. And it can be, <laughs> it can be a dark, can, even right now as I'm talking about this, you can hear a pin drop in here. It's not one of those hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord sermons yet. Amen. But I believe the church should be a hospital where Jesus is our master physician. I believe the church should be a place where those who are physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually wounded can come. I believe the church should be a place where we're able to check in and when we leave, we're healed or at least we're on the road to recovery. I believe the church should be a place of health and not a place of hurt. That the church should be a place where those who are lost can have a seat without being condemned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without being judged. Yeah. Without being... Yeah. <laughs> you see, it's my prayer as a pastor of this church and as a pastors of this church that this house of God will become a hospital. I mean, it already is, but my heart's desire is that this place would be known for its health, for its rejuvenation, for its revival, for its transformation, for its change, for its sustainable change. Not just three-month change, but sustainable change, where people get their lives back, get their families back, get their children back, get their minds back, get their heart back, not just for a season, but for eternity and forever through the sustainable transformational change through the divine position in Jesus. Yes. 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 You see, I envision a healthy local church where hurting people can find acceptance and counselling. I'm all for counselling. Some people say, oh, you know, Christian counselling. I'm all for counselling. Trust me, I've needed loads of it in my life. I probably need more of it in my life. Somebody just to sit down with and let it go. Not be judged, condemned. Not be told you're crazy. You know, we already know that. But I envision a local healthy church where we can find acceptance and counselling. And I, as a pastor, long for the place and people to come into this place so they can be mentored mm -hmm. with godly leaders and also build trustworthy relationships with brothers and sisters in the Lord. Mm -hmm. This is what the church is. In Victory Outreach, I believe, this is where God is speaking to us right now. This is why when I say at the beginning of the sermon, this is a message for us. And you know sometimes when you watch a sermon on YouTube or you, you go somewhere else and you watch a sermon and, uh, and you'll see, oh, it's a great sermon. But see this sermon. If you're watching this and you're part of another church, that's great. This sermon's for Victory Reach. Just letting you know that. So if it's part of your church, then this is for you to take it and receive it. If not, enjoy the word. Amen. Be blessed. But Victory Reach, I believe that we're coming into a season of growth and maturity. I believe we are. I believe we're coming into a season of growth and maturity. As a church, we're four years old. Next year, we'll be five. 
Amen. Like my, my son James, he's four year old right now. He's running about doing care stuff. <laughs> like he's really quite untamable right now at certain points. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen him. Like he was running, doing looks around the sanctuary during the worship rehearsal. And like, <laughs> he's four. He's not there yet. But he's growing. Yeah. He's developing. Yes. He's excited. He's searching. He's moving forward. He's progressing. Yeah. And that's what we are as a church. Mm. We're not 28 years old. We're not like I'm preaching at a church next week in Falkirk for the 112th anniversary. We're not 112. Right? We're four. Hasn't God been good to us in four years? Yes. Hasn't God grown us in four years? Yes. Hasn't God developed us as men and women of God in four years? Haven't, haven't we changed in four years or two years or one year or six months or three months since you've been here? But I believe we're coming to grow and we're growing into a season of growth and maturity. And as we grow as a church, as we grow as a hospital, watch this, we're going to need more nurses. You know what a nurse does? A nurse helps to nurse the hurting back to health. Watch this, through spiritual checkups and house calls. Spiritual nurse. Somebody who can nurse people back to spiritual health. I remember when our kids were young and the, 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 the nurse used to come, she used to wear her kids. You know, you know what I'm talking about. They'll come out, they'll weigh the kids, they'll do all this stuff, you know. They'll go through all them little checks with your children. You know, they should be at different stages. They should be recognising light by this time, you know. They, you know, there's spiritual checkups that follow. And I believe as we continue to grow and mature, not only are we going to be looking for nurses and developing nurses, but we're going to be looking for spiritual doctors. Spiritual doctors are those who are in line with the scriptures and are able to diagnose illnesses and administer the healing power of God's word into people's life. We're also going to be looking for spiritual surgeons. Come on, somebody. We need more surgeons in the house. Amen. Those who can reach down deep inside the soul with the scalpel of God's word. And those who can go deeper than just a plaster, they can go deeper into the soul and into the places that are unseen. And they can administer the healing power of the Holy Spirit into people's lives. But when people come in one way, they may be bleeding, they may be broken, they may be bruised internally. But they sit down in the presence of a spiritual surgeon and they go deep in prayer and deep in fasting and deep in all these things. And everything gets exposed, the old stuff gets taken out, the unsex stuff gets taken out. They get stitched back up with loving grace and they get sent back out to be healthy in the community. This is what the church of the living God should be. We also need paramedics. Come on, somebody. We need paramedics, those who rescue people off the streets and rush them into the house of the Lord. Those who go on the streets and find those that are lying broken, lying hurting, lying defeated, lying depressed, lying in the balconies, lying in the streets. We need paramedics within the church of the living God that are willing to go out onto the streets, reach the hurting people, and rush them in. To the AV of the church. Listen, I know we're sitting here today, man, and God's blessed us. But once we were that person, once we were lying by the side of the road, once we were lying by the gutter, or maybe not, maybe here, you know, maybe you had a, a you know, I don't know, I was sitting we were in, we were all lost and broken at one point, and somebody came and told us about Jesus, and He could help us, He could heal us, He yeah. could make us whole, yeah. He could change our lives. Yeah. And listen, I just came to just remind us today. As great as it is to be in the house of the Lord, there's more people still out there on the road. There's more Apostle Paul still out there on the Damascus Road. There's more confused disciples still out there on the Emmaus Road, wondering if Jesus is real, but their faith is lacking. There's more broken and beaten people still out there being overlooked on the road. Reminds me of the, the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, this was a parable. Uh, one of the religious rulers that spoke to Jesus and said, Master, or Jesus, what must we do to inherit eternal life? He says, love your neighbor, love God, all your, you know, all that, and love your neighbor. And he said, okay, we do that, but what else? Hmm. Jesus says to the guy here, he replies, a man was going down from Jerusalem to, Jer to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of all his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to go down the same road, but when he saw the man, 
passed on the other side of the road. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Oil and wine brings healing. Wine with its uh, alcoholic medicinal purposes helps to heal, helps to clean, and the oil helps to, to cover up the wound and, 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 and soothe it and soften it. He bandaged his wounds, he poured oil and wine in them, then he put the man on his own donkey, which meant he had to walk, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and says, look after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law said, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You see, I love the fact that, it, that, that you know, I, there's two things, that, two things that stand out to me in this scripture. I dislike the fact that the priest and the Levite passed to the other side. I dislike that fact, and I know it's a parable, I know Jesus is using an, an illustration, so it wasn't actually a true story, but it's an illustration, right? But in reality, it can be real. Because we can have people that are religious and call themselves Christians, but when they see somebody on the street, they walk the other side. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to Jesus on a Sunday, on a Monday, they walk past the person who's broken and hurting on the street. And I'm not just talking about the beggar or the homeless or the addict. I'm talking about having eyes to see and ears to hear when you're walking through your local community and your local neighborhood. You see people broken all the time. You see them sitting contemplating, you see them sitting wondering, you see them sitting even broken. A workmate, a work colleague, a friend, a neighbor, a sister who's going through the heights, who's going through the troubles, who's going through the struggles. Amen. The Samaritan traveled and came where he was. He saw him and took pity on him. The Samaritan himself, and this is why I love this story, or parable, an illustration, because the Samaritan himself understood what it was like to be marginalized, mistreated, and misunderstood. A Samaritan was someone who was outside of the Jewish family. They were considered even lower than the Gentiles. They, they, were, they were considered like the, the, the stuff of your shoe. The Samaritan, who himself had been an outcast, or himself had been mistreated, misunderstood, this outcast understood what it felt like to be on that side of the road. And he says, you know what? I know what it's like to be down. I know what it's like to be misunderstood. I know what it's like to be mistreated. I know what it's like to have people walk by me in need. You see, potentially what happened is that the priest and the Levites, you see, the Bible says that this man who was robbed, was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you do your religious studies and your, 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 read your, your, your history, the road to Jericho from Jerusalem was a road of great peril. It was a road where uh, bounty hunters and all, the, and all these different robbers and thieves, because it was a main road between Jerusalem right, and Jericho, the, 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 the hunters and the robbers and the stealers, this, this path, this road, was, a, was like a main road, a main highway where the goods would go, where the, all the food would go, where all the stuff would go. And so listen, if you walked that place on your own, you were leaving yourself open to robbers and attackers and potentially outside of the box thinking for a moment that the, the Levite and the priest maybe thought to themselves, well, he deserves that through his own choices. Because you really shouldn't be walking this road on your own. And I don't know about you, but I just know that some people, when they see people on the street or they see people in a bad situation, their first thing to think is, well, they brought that on themselves. <laughs> but I like to think like the man who was a Samaritan man, who thought we passed that, regardless of how, when, where, why, but there's a soul involved. Yeah. Now, I see someone's brother, someone's someone's uncle, someone's father, someone's you know, someone's grandson. And so the, the Samaritan he went, and out of his own experience, what I love, out of his own experience of being mistreated, misunderstood, out of his own experience, 
he was able to serve someone else. That again brings me back to Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie at the very beginning. People that received the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, received salvation, desperately just went about and wanted to bring other people into that. That's what the hospital is all about. That's what it's all about, church. Letting people who are broken, letting people who are, who are in need of help. I don't know about you, but my, late, my wife Zoe, she, she took one of her daughters to a and &E a few weeks ago uh, at Fourth Valley through there in Larbor and Falkirk. Man, she was there for like six hours just waiting. Mental, right? Crazy place. And it was a Friday night, so you know the later on, the later the night it got, <laughs> the crazier the people came in. Um, but thank God for the hospital. And I know sometimes people have bad things to say about the hospital. Oh, the wait's too long. You know what I mean? You know, it's, you know you're in there, you know, you're in there all night, you know. Everybody's got something bad to say about it. But when you need it, you're there. And I just love it when I finish up this part right now. I just love this part of the hospital of the Samaritan man. It says in verse number 35, watch this. Not only did he pick this guy up, heal his wounds, bandage his wounds, oil and uh, uh, alcohol was wounds. Not only did he, out of his own experience, came grace and mercy, but he followed up on the guy the next day. <laughs> verse 35 says, the next day, he went back and checked up on him. Hey, how you doing? Remember me? He went back on this dude and made sure he was all right. One of the things I love about this church already is that we're a church that loves to call people. You'll know that. You're part of this church. We call you. We text you. Right? Sometimes you may get fed up of it. But I'll tell you one thing. I would rather we text too much than never text at all. There's Pastor Mark texting me again. What's he up to? How does he know what I'm doing right now? Can you see me? I know, we just love you, man. We just love you. We want to make sure you're all right. Simple as that. So the church should be a hospital. Everybody say hospital. 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 Second place the church should be, the church should be a university. A Holy Ghost university. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. This is Jesus himself, uh, or, or Paul, as he writes the epistle to the Ephesian, the Ephesian church. Uh, he himself speaking uh, about Jesus. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry mm -hmm. and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come yeah. to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. That's the New King James Version. I know you're seeing the NLT up here. Part of becoming a Christian which sometimes is overlooked or sometimes undertaught, is that when you give your life to the Lord, you have now enrolled in a university. And I know that frightened some of you, that frightened me in the beginning, because I hated school. <laughs> I was like, you know, plugging school, all that different things. Come on, give me a wave if you ever just did it, decided not to go to school for a couple of years. But we are, as believers, we're called to be equipped. We're called to be equipped. We're called to be trained. We're called to be students. Like when Jesus was walking the earth, they would call him rabbi. And a rabbi had students. And the students of the rabbi would literally walk in the footprints of the rabbi. And I mean literally. Like if the rabbi walked in the sand or walked in the dust and you saw his footprints, this the students wanted to follow the rabbi so much that if the, if the rabbi put his foot left, they put their foot in his footprint. So that they could literally walk in his footsteps. And so as believers in Christ, followers of Christ, we're called to be students. Students of the word, students of God, and students within the church. Why? Because Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? Who are the saints? The believers, right? I'm not into this, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not. 
Theologically, spiritually, you're a saint. Right? Don't get it twisted though. Right? We're not going to make a marble statue of you when you die. All right? And bow down and worship you. Right? Gary, maybe you could put up the mission statement for Victoria's Glasgow right now if you can get it there. We're called to be equipped, the saints, for the work of the ministry. The mission statement of the ministry is we reach the lost, we equip the saints, then we go tell the world what God's done in our lives. Amen. The, para, the paramedics, they go reach the lost and bring them in. When you come into the hospital, you get healed, you start to get healthy, then you start to get trained, you start to get equipped in the things of the ministry. Why is it important that we get equipped? Well, let me explain this to you. Would you go, in fact, some people do, but would you go to a doctor or would you go to a nurse or would you go to a dentist with someone who wasn't certified? Someone that didn't have any expertise, qualification or overarching authority over their lives. We wouldn't, right? You wouldn't go. Some people do, unfortunately. Sometimes you see disasters from turkey teeth and turkey hair. <laughs> Amen. You see, right? They go there because it's cheap. But the reason it's cheap is because they're uncertified and they're using dodgy gear. And so it's, it's important that we're equipped, watch this, like a surgeon, because Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 15, to study to show ourselves approved, someone who rightly uh, 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 dissects the word of God. Hebrews 4 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. So it's important that we get equipped so that we know how to yield the sword, how we wield the sword, how we speak to people about spiritual things. Because what happens is if you have unqualified and unequipped surgeons, they'll cut you open, but leave you bleeding. And so we need in the church of the living God, we need people who are practitioners in health and administrators, administrators of all things, the grace of God. There's too many unequipped Christians out there. Unaccountable. Lone Rangers. Giving out words, giving out prophecies, giving out promises. Laying hands on people. Say, you can pray for me, not a problem. There's only seven people who's going to lay hands on me. I love you all. But when it comes to prayer, when it comes to the things of its spiritual life, right? You ought to be understanding. You ought to be trained and equipped in this. Yeah. If we want people to come into our church and be healed and be, 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 be transformed, then we within the church need to be equipped. How we minister to people, how we train people, how we love people, how we be gracious to them, how we, how we pray with them. How we recognize and discern the things that's taking place within our lives. That's why we need to be equipped. And I love this part here. It says here, and it says here that it says, watch this, it says, um, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Right? A perfect man. Jesus is perfect. Yes. The Lord and Savior is perfect. Yes. We are not. But we come to him as imperfect people. But watch this. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is the role of me, the pastor, and us, the leadership team? What is the role? Some people will say, oh, your role is to build a church. Well, it's true. <laughs> Some people will say, well, you know, have a good worship service. Well, that's true. Some people will say, take a city. Oh, that's true. But it's not the priority. The priority within the church is to disciple people into the fullness of the stature of the image of Christ. That's the priority. That's the master plan. You see, the Bible says that we are co-workers, co-heirs with Jesus. He has this master plan. Paul says that he was a master builder. And a master builder doesn't come up with his own plan. The master builder follows the plan of the architect. Yes. 
And so we don't have the right just to come up with our own, our own idea of the fullness of Christ or our own idea of discipleship. The idea of discipleship as written within the word of God is to disciple people, not to the ministry, not to the church, not to this and not to that, but to disciple people into the fullness and the stature and the maturity to the image of Jesus. Yes. Because here's what happens when we disciple you to the image, miss of the maturity and the stature and the thing of Jesus, everything else around your life will change anyway. Yes, that's it. <laughs> oh, I have a lot of women to go in now. <laughs> I mean, we're called to be equipped for ministry. Watch this, that means that there's a gifting and a calling within every life of the believer. Yeah. That God has a plan for your life. You're not just sitting here today by happen chance. You're not just watching here today by just some form of just coincidence. That God has a plan for your life. You are saved and ransomed and purposely bought for a purpose, for a reason. That God has a plan and a purpose for your life. If he's revealed that to you, great. If he's not, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. For those who ask, seek and knock, they shall find and the door shall be opened unto them. The problem is sometimes we sit in church and we go, oh, God's not speaking, but are we praying? Are we seeking? Are we fasting? Are we, are, are we separating ourselves unto the call of God? Are we laying our lives down and saying, God, I don't care what it is you have for me, Lord, but whatever you have for me, I want. Yeah. Create in me the fullness of Christ. Mm. You see, there's three, the fullness of Christ also, uh, you know, I kind of just love this word tripartite, the, the fullness of Christ, it's kind of made up of three things. And every born again believer should have these things in their life. And if you if you are a born again believer, or you saw somebody who's a born again believer fall away from the faith, it's probably one of these three things that are lacking within their life. To be made into the fullness of the image of Christ, the first thing is we're made into the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. Amen. God's nature, the nature of Jesus. The, the, the nature that's meek, the nature that's loving, the nature, the nature of God. We, the first thing is, as we are made into the fullness of Christ, as we are made into the nature and the image of Jesus Christ. That means that our self dies, that our flesh dies, that our will dies, our desire dies, and we say, Lord, not my will be done, Lord, but your will be done in my life. Come on, somebody, I know. I know you're looking at me saying, Pastor, that's a hard thing, but that's what we're called for. That's what it's all about. Amen. We're called to be made and transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And sometimes what happens is, if somebody falls away from the faith, you know, whether they're backslidden or not, sometimes the character of the Christian is weak. They lack integrity. They lack trustworthy. The second thing for the fullness of Christ, and I am coming into land as new soon, the second thing of the nature of Christ, or sorry, of the fullness of Christ is this, we need the wisdom of Christ. So we're, we're trained, changed and transformed into the nature and the image of Christ and the character of Christ. But the second thing we are in, to be made into the fullness of Christ is that we need the wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is making the right decision with the right information that we have at the right time. Wisdom is making the right choice, God-honoring choice. The choice to go left when he says left. The choice to stick by the word of God and do what the word of God says, that's wisdom. The third thing, when I finish this part of right now, is the third thing we need in the fullness of Christ is this, is that we need the power of God in our lives. The power of God in our lives. And if somebody ever falls away from the faith, it's probably one of these things that's lacking. They lack in character. Amen. They lack in wisdom. Or they lack in power and authority in Christ. We've been called to be students of the word. Third thing and lastly is this, not only are we called to be a hostel, we're also called to be a university, but also we are called to be a base. A base. We want to build a base church here in Glasgow that becomes the launch pad to send out disciples. Like Jerusalem in the early days when the disciples were sent out, 12 were sent, 72 were sent, 120 people were sent. Like the early church in Antioch where Paul and Barnabas got their hands laid on them and they got sent out to go to Cyprus, to go to different places, that the church should be a base and a launch pad where those that are saved, sanctified, discipled and trained have the calling of God upon their life and say, God, I know that you've separated me for a purpose a plan, I know that you've got something for me God, I want to do everything God you've called for my life Lord use me, send me, place me, do what you want with my life like the early church in Antioch where Paul and Barnabas were sent 
We know that scripture in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and it says, and the, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outmost parts of the world. In other words, in other words, what, what happened there was when the Spirit of God came on the believers, they recognized from that moment that their life could go wherever God wanted them to go. And I just think that there's many, many Christians in this day and age also that we have conditional faith. We put conditions on God. We'll say, God, you know, God, whatever, whatever you want. Lord, use me, send me. Just not there. <laughs> oh, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Just not for <laughs> Don't send me over there, Lord. <laughs> but we're in the hands of the Master. We're disciples of the Lord. If He could send 12, 72, 120, if He could send people to Cyprus, to Africa, and all different places, then surely He could send us wherever He wants to send us. And I'm not saying, listen, trust me, I'm not saying, oh, that's it, God's going to call you to, you know, to go and preach the gospel, you know, in a far off land, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, just some strange crowd of people. I'm just saying that our life has to be in the hands of the Lord, that if we're walking down the street, the Lord can say, hey, go speak to him. Go speak to her. Go speak to them. Right, go speak to them. I'm not, uh, missionary work isn't always flying to Africa, or flying to Sweden, or flying somewhere else. Listen, there's a mission where you live right now. Your neighbors are in need. Your co workers are in need. Family members are in need. And so, in a base church, there's a mentality within a base church that says, Lord, send me wherever you want me to go. Just like in Acts 1 8, it was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outmost parts of the world. The vision of victory was Glasgow, it's Glasgow, Dundee, Edinburgh, and Aberdeen. These were the four cities that the Lord placed upon my heart at an altar call in 2017. That first we would, we would plant a church here in Glasgow that would be the launch pad for other churches to come forward. And I know sometimes you look around and you say, who me? Who was? <laughs> I'm sure that's what the early disciples thought too. Mm. We're called to be a base camp. That means that we're a place of safety, we're a place of resource, we're a place of warmth, we're a place where you come and get fed. Uh, you know, I, I know many people climb mountains and, and uh, you know, Mount, my, my, my mother-in-law, she's climbed Mount Millet, Kilimanjaro and uh, different things like that. And I know people climb things like Mount Everest and things like that. But there's an important part of that climb and they call it the base camp. <laughs> the place where they go, the place where they get warm, the place where they get trained, the place where they get healed, the place where they get restored, where they get sent back out again to climb again. For some of us, man, we've been climbing, we've been, we've been doing things, we've been doing great things, but everybody needs a base where they can come into the warm, into the presence of those that care for them, into the presence of those that can bandage them up, wounds, encourage them to go back out again. I want to wrap this up right now and, and, and say just a few things. This is what I believe our church is to be, a hospital for the sick. Amen. Where everybody within this place can come in and find healing and hope and health. And whether you walk out healed one day or you're only just on the beginning of your road to recovery, this is the place you come. The church of the living God. Where the presence of Jesus is. Not only that, we're called to be a university. Where everybody within the church recognizes, I'm a student. I'm here to learn. I don't know it all. And listen, I'm the pastor of this church, man, and I've been serving God for over 20 years. But one thing I always, always know is I don't know all. And I submit myself to God the leadership. I have my pastor, Pastor Paul. I have leadership friends I've got. I meet with them. I submit myself to them. I get support and help from them. We're all learning in this church. My wife and I, we're still learning. I'm on, the, I'm on different courses to learn, study and grow as a leader, as a pastor. How I can become a better minister. How I can become a better you know, shepherd. We're continually learning. We should all be learning. Because we never know everything. And so we need to be, understand that we are uh, in the university of God and God wants to equip us in ministry but also transform us into the fullness and the image of Christ. Amen. Because one thing I do know is people don't need to see me. 
they need to see the fullness of the image of Christ. They might see me, but they need to feel and hear the character of God. They need to feel, hear, and sense the wisdom of God. They need to feel, hear, and sense the power of God. I want to just finish with a, a scripture today and um, it's found in Matthew 11, uh, verse 28. A very famous scripture. If you've been in the church, you'll, you'll have heard it. Maybe it's helped support you. Maybe it's helped encourage you. Um, but as I was praying, and I don't, know every, I don't know personally where everybody is. I don't know what everybody's going through. But I do know the place where everybody needs to go to. It's the same. We all have different issues, different struggles, different battles, but we all have the same ETA or the same location we need to go to. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, he says, come unto me. Right? Well, let's read that out together. Say, come unto me. Come unto me. All who are and I will give you rest. And then there's more of it there. This afternoon, just as I come to wrap up this this, uh, this sermon for today and the last of the, the Heart for the House series, I want you to know that this is a safe place. I want you to know that whatever happens in here stays in here. I want you to know that if you come speak to I, my wife, pastoral team, or one of our leaders, I want you to let you know that we have a code of conduct, that we don't share your news, we don't share what you're going through. We don't post it on Instagram. We don't share it on different things. Amen. We understand our responsibility as spiritual ministers and surgeons and doctors. And within doctors and surgeries and hospitals, there's a code of conduct. Amen. For the person. And I just, I'm, the reason I'm saying that is because maybe you've been in a place before where you've said something, you've exposed something and shared something and next minute you know it's all in the block. Everybody from the scheme knows it. All around the place. I want to let you know today that this is a safe place. That we fear God. And we love God. And we love you. With all of our hearts, we pray for you. My wife and I and our team, we pray for you. We want God's best in you. Somebody once says, you can only ever take people somewhere you've been. You know, Jamie might know that as somebody who goes up mountains and hills. You know, you, you can only take somebody somewhere you've been. I can only take you where I've been. And let me tell you where I found my healing and my help and my strength and my hope and my guidance. In the presence of Jesus. I've tried everything else. Searched all over. Been there, been there, done that, done this. The place that I was made whole was in the presence of Jesus. Let's go close our eyes for a second. Father, we thank you, we thank you for your word. We stand before you amazed and in love with you, Lord. We thank you that you are here with us, precious Holy Spirit, we can sense your presence. We can sense that you're moving in amongst us right now, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you are the fullness of Jesus. You were sent another of Jesus. You are Jesus. Just as where Jesus was limited to one place at one time, Holy Spirit, you are unlimited. You are omnipresent, Holy Spirit, which means that you can be in every person's life at one point at the same time. And I know, Lord, Holy Spirit, there's many people in this sanctuary and watching today that have many, many things in their lives hoping for, dreaming for, desiring, desire to break, desire to free, desire to be begin, desire to be healed, desire to restore. And only you know, God. And I ask you today, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would begin to minister to us right now. Come on, why don't you